Africa. There's a lot of unparliamentary behaviour going on up here. <laughs> They're having a bet about how soon I'll cry. Okay. So the let's... member for Jagger Jagger on indulgence. Thank you. <laughs> um, those of you who do know me very well know that the hardest thing about delivering this speech uh, will be whether I make it through. Over 23 years in this place, I have, it's true, quietly or not so quietly, sobbed as good friends have said their farewells. Carl, oh, you said. <laughs> 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 oh. Who am I going to miss the most, Mr. Speaker? Well, now it's time for mine. It's true that I don't like talking about myself, um, but I hope you'll all permit me to say a few personal things and, of course, many thank yous. Uh, but I do want to talk about some things I've been thinking about, our party, our parliament, our country and its future. First, I want to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and I pay respects to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. These are the words that the speaker uses to start every sitting day. When I was first elected all that time ago, we didn't do that. We do now. Back then, we hadn't said sorry to the stolen generations and the disadvantage gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians was a gulf. A lot has changed, but too much has not. The shameful historical treatment, the present disadvantage and injustices should make us determined to do more and do better with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander citizens. And please, please let us not go back to the false dichotomy between practical and symbolic change in Indigenous affairs. A good education is vital. So is health care, housing, employment. But so is pride in yourself, power over your own life, a sense of belonging and respect. And that's what the Voice to Parliament is all about. Our first Australians being heard, being included, being respected. This could be a powerful, unifying new institution for our country, something all of us can be proud of. So let's get on with it. I do very much hope that this fabulous new generation of parliamentarians sitting here today will do just that. You, all of you, are the custodians of our democracy now and our democracy really must be nurtured. In my first speech, I spoke about citizenship. I said it wasn't just about having a vote or holding a passport. It means being able to share in the life of the community. It means enjoying a certain level of security. It means belonging. The truth is we all need each other. We need to look out for each other, protect each other, and protect the institutions that bind us together. There are some things in life we should all be able to rely on. We all deserve to know that no matter what, old or young, city or bush, rich or poor, we'll all be able to lead good, meaningful lives full of purpose. That Australians can afford to see a doctor that the children I've met in Fitzroy Crossing get the same chance as a, at a great education as children in Melbourne, that pensioners in my West Heidelberg have the dignity and security in retirement just like everyone else, that my children's generation can fulfil the dream of, of home ownership. Now, each and every one of us is subject to the twists and turns of fate. Our social safety net is there to protect everyone, and everyone deserves the security of knowing it's there when they need it. If these fundamentals of Australian life break down or only exist for the better off, then our social fabric breaks down. 
and the same goes for our national institutions. Canberra, of course, can seem a world away for someone trying to raise a family or find a job as they turn their TV sets on to see politicians talking nothing about nothing else but themselves. Australians are losing faith. They don't trust the institutions and systems that they were told are there to provide for them and protect them. And why would they? Why would they? What splashed across the front pages during the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse and the Banking Royal Commission reinforced what many people had long suspected, that the system is rigged. The powerful people can do what they want, take what they want, and nothing will change. That there's one Australia for a few and another Australia for the rest. I do fear that something has shifted in our national psyche in these past few years. There's a disconnect, in fact, a giant chasm between the lives that most Australians are leading and the priorities of the institutions and people who are meant to be serving them. But I fear more for the reckoning it seems to be heralding. It's bad enough for Australians to lose faith in us. It's worse still if they give up on us. We cannot allow that to happen. Our people are too important, and what we've all built is too precious to let it all crumble. I believe there's a common cause to the divisions and exclusions that exist in our society. It's inequality. It's dragging us down. It's the wealth gap between the top and the rest, the disadvantage gap between the first Australians and the rest of us. It's the opportunity gap between young Australians and the rest of us. And it's something less tangible, less recognisable, but more pervasive and punishing. It's the poverty of hope that inequality breeds. Inequality in all its forms is the driving force behind the divisions in our society, and confronting inequality wherever it is found has been my motivation for a career in public policy, because tackling inequality needs government. A government that believes in creating opportunity. I came to this place knowing that government matters, but I leave here more sure of that than ever. Now, when I was studying economics at university, it was a long time ago, they taught us about Adam Smith's invisible hand. And when I was a young policy researcher, Margaret Thatcher was telling the Brits there's no such thing as society. Well, I thought it was a load of nonsense back then, and I haven't changed my mind. <laughs> government matters. Good government matters. And good governments are active governments, activist governments. They protect, they empower, because only government can put the rules in place to stop the gross abuse by the powerful and corrupted. Only governments can create something like Medicare or the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the essential supports that are there for all of us. Good, active governments need leaders prepared to make big decisions and people prepared to do the detailed policy work and the advocacy. And that's what I've tried to do here, and we did do some good. We delivered the single biggest increase to the pension in its history, yeah. leaving, lifting one million older Australians out of poverty. We delivered the first national paid parental leave scheme, enshrining the economic and social value of working parents, particularly working women. We introduced the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the biggest social reform of our generation giving people with disability the equal place in society that they deserve but have been denied. We also secured the largest funding increase for housing in remote Indigenous communities. 
And as I've reflected on these achievements in recent weeks, it's certainly clear there is no finish line for us progressives, no distant point in the future when we can say that our job is done. The social democratic task, building an economy where everyone can contribute and everyone can share in its growth, is a perpetual task. And I do have enormous faith that the next Labor government will be a progressive, reforming Labor government in the best of our traditions. Bill and Tanya's leadership and their partnership has defined this period I just can't look at Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely right about that, Wayne. <laughs> but it has defined this period of opposition. Their unity of purpose and policy focus means Labor is ready to take up the task, ready to rebuild the safety net that's been cut, to restore the trust that's been lost, ready to return fairness to the centre of economic and social policy. As ever, this will require hard work and tough choices. And I have to say, I think of one person when I say those words. Penny Wong's leadership in the Senate personifies this approach. I think all of us come here a little naive. I certainly did. Not aware of how much we'll be tested, how often we'll have to grapple with competing priorities. And I see the member for Curtin uh, opposite me. Uh, she and I have shared a lot uh, of um, instability in our parliamentary careers uh, that I don't think we anticipated when we first came in. We all have very high hopes of what we can achieve, but each of us is confronted with very difficult decisions about what we will or won't say, what we will or won't do, how our words and actions could heal or hurt. The evidence before us, public opinion, our relationships, party loyalty, personal morality, all of this influences us. I remember the first time I was confronted with something like this, an issue where I had to stand up for what I believed. It was the fight over overseas aid that supported the reproductive rights of women. I'd actually only been here a few weeks, maybe a bit too soon, to be disagreeing with the wonderful Kim Beasley, uh, but so it was. There have been many, many more of these difficult decisions since particularly on the Expenditure Review Committee, where you have to weigh the value of spending money on one group of people or another. But this is why we're here. We are brought here to make these hard decisions. It doesn't mean we always get it right. We don't. But the public will understand us more and respect us more if they know how we make these decisions and know about the choices that they involve. It's also sometimes the case that the big decisions aren't so big after all. They're not so hard after all when their time has come. Think of the apology. All those years it was resisted, compounding the hurt. But in the moment when Kevin finally spoke for all of us, and I mean all of us, and said that one word, sorry, it seemed so simple, so easy. Why did it take so long? but it needed leadership. And so for the Royal Commission into Institutional Child Sexual Abuse, it was so important for so many people who had been abused and not believed. Yet I remember one prominent commentator at the time referred to Julia's decision to hold a Royal Commission as gesture politics. Of course, no one would say that now. I'm so honoured to have been involved in delivering on those two huge decisions and honoured to have come to know and love so many of the stolen generations and their families and the people that we now know as the forgotten Australians. These have been moments to treasure. There are many other memories and special moments that I'll take with me, far too many to mention, but I just want to touch on a few. Welcoming the Japanese Prime Minister with a haiku poem in Japanese. Getting a hug from Nelson Mandela, beat that. 
sitting in the Cabinet room on the Sunday when the global financial crisis was collapsing. Uh, the global financial system was collapsing with, with, with Kevin and a few others. Wayne was on the phone from the United States as we decided the plan to save Australians from mass unemployment. Singing Stand By Me with an Aboriginal friend whose two brothers had committed suicide. As uh, Bill would know, being with the communities affected by the Black Saturday bushfires as they walk through the wreckage of where their homes used to stand. Standing arm in arm with families as Julia announced we would begin the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And one of my favourites, hugging a mum whose child with autism had just learned to speak as he sang Baba Black Sheep. I've given and received a lot of hugs. <laughs> and I've made so many wonderful friends, all of you. I will miss the camaraderie. I do wish I could mention you all. We're brought together from so many different parts of the country, different backgrounds, and in this intense environment over a long period, you do make deep connections and come to understand and trust one another. Although, after what we've all been through, and I mean all of us, uh, over, the, over the last few years, uh, it may not seem like it, but it is possible and it does happen. Some of the friendships are more unlikely than others, but are brought, born out of shared values and a deep commitment to serve others. <laughs> Breathe deeply. Okay. Like two of my closest friends, Tanya, of course, I can't say any more, uh, <coughs> but she's a lot younger than I am. That's why it's unlikely. A lot younger. <laughs> and my friend Wayne, he's from the Queensland right. You could say it's practically another planet. Um, <laughs> but I am originally a Queenslander, so that must be it. Both so special to me, and I thank them. Anthony Albanese. There he is. <laughs> oh dear, this is hard. Who has always had my back, always, for 23 years. That's not a bad innings, Anthony. Linda Burney, who has the biggest, biggest heart of all. Tony Burke, as the leader of opposition business, who I just can't get off the tactics committee. <laughs> uh, and as well as our leaders, of course, our whips, who keep us all together. Chris Hayes, it's true, is a gentleman of politics, frankly, whose only failing of leadership has been his decision to appoint me as captain of our parliamentary swimming team. <laughs> All this time, we've only beaten the coalition swimmers once, and that's only thanks to Matt Thistlethwaite, <laughs> and we've never beaten the parliamentary press gallery team. I think you're all a lot younger. <laughs> He's not in the team. <laughs> Chris and I, uh, on a serious note, have spent many, many hours with our arms around our colleagues when they needed our professional and personal support. And that is something that people don't see. Uh, there are so many things here that people don't see. There have been many speakers uh, in my time here, and a few unusual ones. And Mr. Speaker, it would probably be unparliamentary to tell too many stories about them. But if I can just say to you, Mr. Speaker, thank you for your patience. Uh, I know that I can be cheeky or noisy, uh, but uh, you, I think, have done a wonderful job for this parliament. So I want to say to you and all the staff of the parliament, particularly to you, David, uh, all the very best for the future. To my dozens and dozens of staff, uh, my personal staff that I've had over the years, they've been renowned for their kindness, their brilliance, their commitment to labour values and their incredible fertility. <laughs> Now, everybody knows that I love children, and uh, I have to say it has been such a joy to welcome so many Macklin Office babies over the years. You cannot do anything without great staff. 
My electorate office has been led for so long by the wonderful Anthony Kenny and before him Vicky Ward. Thanks so much to Lachlan and Caitlin, Emily and Mitch. In my ministerial office, my chiefs of staff, I can't mention all of the wonderful staff, but just to the chiefs of staff, Joanna Brent, Ryan Batchelor, Corey McKenzie, they have just been so outstanding in their contributions to our country. And I particularly want to thank Mike Dillon and the young ones. I still call them the young ones, Jared and Max. In my office in opposition, Alistair, Alice, Catherine, Alicia and Tim. And all the public servants who I won't know, name because it might get them into trouble, uh, and the advocates. Without them, without the public servants, without the advocates, you cannot deliver big reform. Like all MPs, I think it's true. We love our communities that we represent, and I certainly do. I love the sporting clubs, the historical societies, the groups that look after the rivers and creeks, the volunteers who sit with the sick and the lonely. I have a wonderful Somali community. Of course, my branch members, so dedicated, passionate and supportive. Now, if there can be such a thing, I'm the number one ticket holder for the Austin and Repatriation Hospitals, <laughs> having saved them from Jeff Kennett selling them, trying to sell them off. And the West Hartleberg Community Health Centre, one of the first Whitlam Community Health Centres, is just the best. I just want to say to all of my constituents, it has been the greatest privilege to support you, stand with you and serve you. Thank you to my neighbours in the parliament, uh, I mean at home in Melbourne, to Andrew Giles, to Jed Carney. I also just want to say something to those opposite. It doesn't happen often, but when we do find common cause, it's important and very impactful. What an amazing day it was when we all voted together for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Now for the hard part. <coughs> you think it's been easy so far. <laughs> My family. The hardest thing about political life is the time I have missed with my children. There you go, I've got it out. But here they are, the three of them, all grown up into the most delightful adults, Josie, Louis and Serge. We're so proud of each of you. And now we're joined by Julia and Laura and, of course, top of the pops, Camille, our granddaughter. And another is to be born in a few weeks. We are so lucky. I do recall being in a cabinet meeting only to be called out by one of the boys that they couldn't find their football boots. Of course, whatever I was doing was irrelevant. They needed their boots. But they didn't like it when people were in the news being mean to their mum. When I was the Shadow Minister for Health, I was in a serious scrap with Michael Wooldridge, the Health Minister at the time, and some of you might remember the scan scam. This was happening at the same time as the debate over the introduction of the GST. Now, Mr Wooldridge kindly suggested that the only time I'd have to pay the GST on Panadol was when I had my tattoos removed. The children were not impressed. <laughs> Although after this, an older Liberal gentleman approached me in the chamber to say, we know that a nice girl like you wouldn't have a tattoo. <laughs> in typical Labor form, one of our Labor colleagues, not here today, followed him by sh shouting, show us your tats. Now, nothing, absolutely nothing at all, would have been possible without Ross. It's been a great gift. 40 years of love and friendship. 40 years. And it's just been, it would be impossible for me to say what that means to me. Thank you so much. I've been lucky to have been sustained by the companionship of Canberra friends, some of whom are here today. 
especially the so kind Julia Ryan, and also the patience of our Melbourne friends. And I do want to particularly thank those people who helped us when Ross was sick and also when the children were doing year 12. I think they mostly fed them. Um, my thanks uh, also to my parents and my sister, who have been an endless source of love and support. Now, I don't like to reflect on it much, as uh, I'm aware I am getting older, first and foremost because I'm a grandma, but secondly because of the pride I, I feel in all of you. This uh, amazing generation, new generation of Labor MPs. When I first came into the parliament, there were only four Labor women in the House. Four. Can you imagine? Yeah. Now we're on the cusp of 50 50 representation and so much stronger for it. Quotas work. I'm excited for this generation and excited that you'll be joined, I hope, by Kate Thwaites as the new member for Jagger Jagger. I was fortunate to have her working for me as we delivered paved parental leave and the National Disability Insurance Scheme. She certainly knows how to think big and get the big things done, and she's a mum, so she knows how to multitask. My first vote was in 1974 for Gough and for Labor. I couldn't vote in 1972 because 18-year-olds weren't allowed to vote back then, although, of course, Gough would change that. But I do remember being swept up in the energy and urgency of that election, the infectious feeling that change was finally coming. Gough said, it's time, and it was, and now it's time for me. Time to move on, time to step back, Time for this wonderful new generation of brilliant people to make their impact, as I know you will. There's nothing wrong with having a big heart in politics. Maybe don't sob as much. <laughs> Seriously, there is nothing wrong at all with a big heart. There are people who really depend on us, who really need us. So heed the words of Martin Luther King. Power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at, the, at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. Thank you. Thank you.